uh, you know, kind of doing justice to the patient because all the desired information will be available to you. So how does one prepare? Um, you go on to the machine and you have to add the patient data first and then the uh, interface available where you can put in the name of the patient and the vessel which you are uh, going to uh, image. The next thing is that you have to take the OCT catheter out and uh, you take a wet cause piece and roll over the OCT catheter activating the hydrophilic uh, coating. And then and you, you will see a side port through which you attach a 2cc syringe or a 3cc syringe and inject some uh, uh, pure contrast through this so that at least you see three drops coming out. It will require some effort to do that because the lumen is very small. Then you have a dock cover. You have to have a dock uh, cover because the dock will be in the right next to you. So it has to be uh, sterile. So in the dock cover, you put um, the uh, dock and um, thereafter, uh, once the slides have stopped, okay, you connect the, you take the OCT catheter and connect it to the dock. So this is by, uh, you know, uh, slight clockward, uh, clockwise rotation and you will, the machine automatically will light up a few LED lights and you'll see on the display that the catheter is being connected. Once the catheter is connected, you have to do a test image by pinching the infrared light source, which is there. The the uh, camera is just close to that uh, light source and uh, thereafter you are now ready to uh, kind of uh, uh, acquire the image either using an automatic uh, injector or uh, using a manual uh, injections with the syringe so we'll come to these uh, injector pump settings as we go on uh, with this uh, lecture well, this is a typical setup. You can see the dock with the catheter connected. The catheter is going through the um, tuhi into the uh, guider and um, you have the uh, automatic injector connected here to one of the side ports of the uh, manifold and um, it's all uh, done. The only precaution which we also advise while doing rotabilization here is that the Y connector, if you're using, especially if you're using a rotating one, you should not tighten it too much because it will prevent the purging of the catheter and can damage the optical fibers and uh, the catheter. If the optical fiber is damaged, then the game is over. You will need a new catheter. Well, we, as I mentioned earlier, that um, you need some kind of media to clear the contrast, so uh, to clear the blood column. So generally, we use um, BusyPack, or you can also use Idoxinol. So Io, um, Idoxinol or Iohexol, either of the two can be used, depending on the renal uh, functions. It's very important to know the renal uh, function, and I always advise that in any given lab where you are working, there should be three things mentioned for each patient before you start the case, the creatinine clearance, the LV function, and the hemoglobin. You know, before starting these, are, I have some idiosyncrasies. I always look at these three things before I start my case because it helps me plan my procedure. It helps me regulate my contrast load. I, If you are doing a chip case, then you have to be careful. Or even if you are doing a, not, a simple case, you have to be careful that you don't overload the patient with contrast and then you have to hold him back for another four or five days because he's developed renal function. So uh, basic idea being that um, you uh, have to acquire the information which is required. Well, um, the uh, as I told, when you're starting, you should always use an automated uh, injection because uh, it gives you very good images. The only downside of this is that too much of contrast goes in because you cannot regulate the volume of contrast. Like if I have to interrogate distal left main or the proximal LED, I'll prefer a manual injection because I inject only six, seven ml of contrast. And thereafter I stop injecting because I, I have only that much of segment to interrogate. But all this will come gradually. To begin with, it's always nice to use the automated uh, injections because uh, that will give you nice, good, clear uh, images. And if you've decided to use a manual injection, those who have some experience, uh, you can use a 20cc syringe. And uh, I will tell you a very important fact when I, when I come to the next part of uh, the manual injection. These are the injectors in, um, power injector settings. Um, there is 
a slight difference between small and the large arteries but i i, I feel that as long as you are injecting about 12 to 14 uh, cc's it's good enough and um, this is uh, this ki kind of a busy slide with a lot of parameters here and there but i what i would um, recommend is that if you are uh, injecting inject 14 cc's at 4 ml per second and that's good enough you'll get good images yes for large vessels there's slightly more volume is required but i think you can manage with the same volume uh, there um, as well well this slide shows you the catheter catheter is about the usable length of the catheter is about 135 uh, centimeters and it's a 2.7 trench uh, catheter and um, you uh, as you, you can see the uh, distal most end uh, has got a blue tip with, through which the wire goes and wire comes out uh, it's got a very short rapid exchange of about uh, 20 uh, millimeters or so and you will see three markers as you can see on the slide they have been marked as uh, yellow the the distance between the distal most uh, uh, marker and the middle marker is about uh, 26 uh, uh, millimeters and that between the middle and the proximal marker is about uh, 50 uh, millimeters so the um, the optical lens is located about two millimeters distal to the middle uh, marker so the only precaution here is that the catheter is a little soft it's got a very short terminal rapid exchange so it has to be introduced very gently and um, the other precaution is that if you are doing a tortuous vessel and you are finding it slightly difficult for the catheter movement i mean you are finding it difficult to introduce the catheter that can happen in tortuous vessel that can happen in uh, circumflex so what you need to do is what we do with the thrombosuction catheter is you take the guide wire and the catheter together so you can pull back the guide wire a little and then take the catheter and the guide wire together so that the catheter goes don't be in a hurry don't push hard otherwise it will start looping in the left main or it will disengage the guider and it the entire thing can come out so you have to be very gentle and if you're finding it still difficult, it's not a bad idea to use a guide extension uh, catheter in difficult uh, situations to put this uh, imaging catheter inside. The next generation um, OCT catheters, which are yet to come and which are probably in use in US, uh, are going to be more sturdy and uh, their pushability is considerably better than the uh, current generation uh, catheters. A typical setting, you have a guiding catheter in and uh, the vessel has been cannulated. You have the 014 wire, uh, which is the cross. And as I told you, this got uh, three uh, markers, the middle, uh, the proximal distal and a middle uh, marker. These are, um, the, the pullback is going to be from the middle marker backwards and the vessel, uh, you have two modes on which you um, work with this uh, catheter. You have, um, uh, one is a high resolution mode and the second is the uh, survey uh, mode and once you um, uh, initiated the pullback and this is how the the catheter spins at 360 degrees on its axis and uh, comes back once the complete run is over the catheter will get back automatically to its uh, original position as you can see happening on the, uh, the slide so um whenever you are inserting you should always do it in standby mode because you would not like to uh, you know kind of let this optical lens dance within the uh, guider or uh, within the part of the vessel which you are not going to interrogate so be very careful uh, about this that always introduce the catheter on a standby uh, mode this is a small uh, video uh, which is uh, which summarizes uh, what I have told uh, till now. The catheter being taken out, a wet gauze piece uh, being uh, put on top to activate the hydrophilic uh, coating. Now you can see the nurse injecting pure contrast, and at the same time, she's looking uh, for the spill of the contrast. And once she's assured, it takes a uh, few seconds for that to happen. Once that has happened, she's now opening the packet and she'll take out a dock extension. Now dock extension, you should always keep the uh, uh, the end, which is a hole towards your own self and then put two hand sleeves around and separate the hands as she's done. 
the other assistant puts the dock inside and he pulls the entire cover back so it's as easy as this she just hangs now she's put the uh, the hole in the dock cover against the mouth and she's now taking the catheter inside and a slight clock movement and the catheter is now ready as you can see she once the catheter has been calibrated and uh, it, it's ready to use, you can pinch and you can see that uh, you are ready for the image uh, acquisition. Well, uh, we have four P's when we uh, do the OCT, the uh, what we call classically as a purge position uh, uh, pullback. So first is the purge. Purge is required because this clears the inner uh, lumen and um, once you clear the inner lumen this is very important because the blood is, blood is going to seep it is in this space that the lens is uh, moving or the camera is moving and you must always purge while you are on the standby mode the uh, the catheter is going to calibrate itself the calibration means that you're going to acquire a lot of measurements and there is a the if you've not calibrated the measures measurements are going to go wrong so you will see four blue markers and they have to be touching the ends of the catheter as you can see in the third image which is there so must you must make sure that your catheter is calibrated correctly now all this is uh, done uh, automatically and you have to calibrate each and every time before acquiring the um, image so the fourth P which I had missed out was a puff. That means you put a guider and now since you have to clear the contrast, you have to give a small puff of contrast to see whether your the lumen of the lumen of the vessel is getting cleared or not. And this basically ensures that the, your guide catheter is coaxial and is sitting well. Now it's very important that the lumen is completely cleared of blood. You can see some swells in the left image, whereas in the right image, the lumen is absolutely clear of the uh, swirls and you are assured that you will acquire a good image well once you've done all that the third p which is the uh, pullback so every time you have to do pullback i told you that you have to calibrate so you can see this small round button on the left uh, picture which says uh, auto calibrate and once the auto calibration is uh, done you have to now go to the fourth third p which is the position so you've done the purge you've done the puff you've uh, done now you're ready for the pullback so you have to ensure that the catheter position is right by position i mean that the middle marker has to be distal to the segment which you're going to interrogate because it's the middle marker which identifies the lens mark which identifies where the lens of the catheter is located and going to move backwards from there so this has to be distal uh, to the lesion it's very very important well now uh, the most important thing at the time of the pullback is the clearance which you have to achieve so it has to be synchronized and as you can see two red lines in this slide at the distal part so what i am trying to tell you is that the contrast injection has to precede the pullback that means the contrast has to go in first and it has to clear the column and then the uh, imaging uh, starts and you stop injecting the contrast because uh, the imaging is imaging catheter will acquire the desired image at a speed by by which you and you would not like to overload this patient with more contrast so all this has to be timed with the um, with the assistant so you start injecting slightly in advance and stop injecting because the cam ca catheter is going to come back into the guider or will finish the segment which you need to interrogate much before the contrast gets uh, delivered. Well, uh, there are machines now which uh, earlier we were we did not have this facility of angio core registration, which basically implies that the the OCT image can be correlated to the angiographic image. Now, this is a big step forward because this will tell you uh, we often see plaques and we kind of uh, correlate them with the septals or diagonals in uh, case of LAD or in the circumflex with the OM branches or in RCA with the RV branch or the PD or PLV. Now, this job has been made easier by angiopore registration. That means your image which you get in the OCT will be correlated with the angiographic uh, image. So in order to do so, you have to select an angiopore 
acquire angio button as you can see on the left side of the image and you have to um, then enable the dock or trip the auto calibrate button down below and this auto calibrate is going to set it uh, on the angio core uh, mode and then you have to press on to the cine pedal and start acquiring the uh, uh, cine angiographic image so we'll go a little bit uh, in detail uh, of this. So you have to start acquiring the cine angiogram and thereafter you have to acquire the image. So there are going to be three clicks which you do on the uh, on the CPU or the central processing unit or if you're being assisted and if you're not using the dog. The first is auto calibrate. The second click will tell you enable pullback. Correct. And the third will be acquire the image. This is on a manual mode. And if you're using an automatic mode, then the machine automatically will detect the clearance in the vessel and acquire the uh, image. So uh, I mean, this cine paddle has to start and uh, you have to step off the cine paddle on, upon completion of the uh, pullback. So this basically, if you're using an automatic synchronized uh, uh, power injector cine imaging, then it, it everything will happen on its own the uh, contrast will be flushed few seconds before the image will be acquired and then you have to when you moment you put your foot off the image is also there and everything is uh, done with so the most important thing here is to acquire the cine angiogram in a view which gives you all the desired information and which for a given lesion the operator would know the best whether you have to acquire the image in the caudal or the cranial view now this primarily depends on uh, the uh, the lesion and its distribution so that you can have some correlation with the branches and you can and if you have an angiocore registration along with your city you don't need any further uh, angiographic runs or views to qualify or to kind of uh, you know uh, landmark the uh, lesion so if all the desired information now you will get on your oct machine where a marker will move and tell you that close to the septal or close to the diagonal, what does the plaque uh, look like and whether the segment is normal or whether you can stent, uh, whether you need to stent this part or you can leave it. Well, angiocore registration is not supported uh, below Sinai frame count rate of uh, 15 frames per second or more than 30 frames per second. So you have to generally we do it at the 15 uh, frames per second. And uh, the second part I've already uh, told you that you need to um, be uh, very careful in selecting on this star, uh, slide kind of summarizes what I have uh, told you you go on a live view you then enable and the countdown starts for about uh, 50 seconds then you press on the cine pedal moment you press your assistant uh, injects the contrast you detect the optimal blood clearance and with the, if there is complete clearance step six as we see then you acquire or you enable the pullback and the image gets acquired moment the image is acquired you take your foot off and stop injecting the contrast and stop the uh, cine so it, it's a complete cycle it even though it might sound a little uh, complicated but it's not as complicated as i'm making it sound and it's a very busy slide so once you do it in your lab you will find it absolutely uh, convenient uh, the quality of image is what is very, very important. So I, I mean, whether you acquire manually or you through the manual injection or through an injector, the um, quality of image is uh, very, very important. And uh, you have to, because at the end of the day, you are acquiring an image just to know more about uh, the uh, lesion, which is there in terms of the lesion morphology distribution and uh, kind of sizing the uh, uh, your hardware, I mean, in terms of balloon, stent. So you have to ensure that the, uh, the catheter is uh, free of blood. The catheter is not occlusive. I'll show you case examples tomorrow where uh, if the catheter is occlusive, you'll not get good images. So you have to kind of pre-dilate the lesion. Uh, the scan area has to be within the range of this catheter. So extremely large vessels, you will see a uh, a fallout and you'll not be uh, you know uh, able to size them the uh, region of 
interest has to be recorded. And this is what is the importance of positioning the catheter uh, well, so that you kind of identify the proximal and distal reference and uh, can make out that, okay, this is the segment which I'm going to do. Uh, you have to, if you're using an angioco registration, you have to recognize the important uh, structures and uh, measurements is the key. You need to measure both the proximal, distal, and we'll, we'll see all this uh, tomorrow. So what I mean is that a good image is the hinge on which the precision PCI is going to be based. Why I call it precision PCI? Because you will avoid um, a lot of complications in terms of geographical mismatch, or you will pick up a few things which angiography is not going to uh, tell you about in terms of edge dissection, plaque prolapse, or malaposition, or under expansions. So you are going to do everything optimally, but all that is possible only if you have acquired a good image. Um, this is the uh, dock which you have, which is also called the drive motor and uh, optical. Uh, I've forgotten the C. So uh, I, anyway, so this this has everything which you um, uh, need uh, to acquire. So if you don't have an assistant, you can uh, uh, very you can use it yourself on the table. You can enable. You can calibrate. You can uh, thereafter. Um, acquire all the images. Now, once you are done with the procedure, the uh, important thing here is that you cannot pull, just pull out the catheter. You have to kind of press the unload button and you'll see some LED lights on display. Once those LED lights have stopped displaying or have, uh, un, uh, have kind of uh, disappeared, then you can uh, rotate the catheter in an anti-clockwise direction and pull it out. Now, this is very, very important. I have seen a lot of operators in a hurry. They just kind of anti-clock and pull it and that will damage the dock and the uh, if the dock, dock gets damaged then the game is over because then you need a replacement and you need a new uh, dock and for the period for which this is off your machine is going to be uh, off so this practically completes the uh, initial uh, setup and if anyone has any questions at this stage i'll be happy to answer before going on to the image interpretation So I may ask a question. Yeah, please. Hello. Yeah. So in between two runs of yes, OCT, please carry on. I can hear you. In between two runs yes. of OCT, would you disconnect the catheter from the dock, or would you leave it connected and keep it on the side, or? I, I I think this is a very very important question. Number one is once the catheter is connected to the dock, it has to be left connected you never disconnect number two what do you what do you do because you have a very busy table you've got bowls with contrast flush material gauze pieces syringes one bowl with ntg everything on the so the most important thing here to remember is that please put the catheter back in the hoof your the hoof in which the catheter comes that has to be put on the table you thread it back into the hoof and keep it on the table within the hoof Otherwise, one bowl will be kept. Generally, I've seen in lab, what they do is they turn it around into three circles and put the saline flush bowl on top of the catheter. Please don't do that. You will damage the optical uh, fiber cable. So put it back in the hoof in which the catheter had come. Now the catheter is absolutely safe. It will not get damaged. Any kink or pressure on the catheter is going to damage it. And if you disconnect, you're, you there is absolutely no rationality because we know that we use the catheter for pre-PCI, during PCI, and uh, post-PCI run. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be used again. It's not that it has completed its job. So, you have to protect it. It's a very delicate thing. So, put it back in the hoof. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Sir, uh, I want to ask, uh, uh, there is a lot of fluoro time uh, is there while putting the catheter inside the artery. So can we take ACR or fluoro also, sir? Any uh, possibilities there? Or okay. every time we have to take CNA only? Fluoro uh, time you, you meant while introducing the catheter into the artery? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This time is too much. Okay. Uh, already is there. 
taking one cine in, uh, while uh, doing acr also so if it is possible to take it uh, acr on fluoro also so um i i i will um tell you um, a very important thing that number one when you're taking the catheter inside you don't need to fluoro at all you would know the exact length of the catheter there are markings there you can blindly go till those markings inside without doing any fluoro at all correct thereafter you have to introduce the catheter under fluoro which will be like we do it for the coronary uh, balloons we take we don't fluoro while taking these balloons inside so you don't need to fluoro while you are uh, taking the catheter inside you need to just position it properly and you by virtue of you know orientation of the image you will know as to where exactly the lesion is located and how much you have to go in or how proximal or distal you have to keep the middle marker to acquire the image once having done that you it is mandatory that you take a cine angiogram and um, you don't you can't have a fluoro save and this thing because you have to do a cine angiogram because it is kind of coupled with the angiogram registration because you need a good quality image to be uh, there that is one now radiation exposure is tremendous or is multifolds when you use sten boost which is a very common you know alternative which a lot of people advocate for imaging they say we do it and and for i think everybody on the panel would be aware that we have almost four times more radiation exposure if we use ten boost so one cine angiogram co registered with the oct is going to give you a wealth of information thereafter you would not need because you will have such beautiful markers available in relation to the branches which are there i mean if you are doing led between septal diagonal you will be able to not only calculate the stent length the diameter and but also you will have an angiographic correlation in terms of your stent placement so you will save a lot of radiation yes sir sir uh, other thing is sir, uh, can i can i ask one question sir sir can i dr chada can i ask one question see i yeah. find that this uh, dragonfly catheter is very very soft and because of the short uh, monorail tip you know length i find it extremely difficult to maneuver in the circumflex artery particularly when there is some calcification or so so how do you overcome that sir what do you do then do you put a, uh, a guideline or something and then go through it or any other method which you advocate sir i think i specifically mentioned this in the beginning of my talk and when i was there so what we do is for calcified vessel or for the circumflex or for the tortuous vessels you um it's, it's a soft catheter i quite agree with you so you have to take the help of a guideliner if you have a guideliner or a guide extension or a guidezilla or a telescope whatever is available in your lab number 2 what you do is that you pull the wire back a little and then you hold both the wire and the catheter together and take it inside as an assembly together and you have to do this very gradually you know if you push it hard it won't go so you have to kind of rotate and do very small small uh, movements and it will certainly uh, thread once it crosses the initial and if you still find it difficult in a calcified vessel you can balloon dilate create a little more passage and then take the catheter inside there are same, occasions same thing when, happens uh, the same thing happens also when the artery is very tortuous also you know the same yes, thing happens yes, there also yes, yes so you absolutely. do the same maneuver for that also yes absolutely absolutely Absolutely. and you have to be very very slow in pushing it right yes absolutely otherwise you will not only loop you can damage the catheter so there are uh, catheters which get damaged if you use a lot of force the optical fiber okay. can get damaged okay sir thank you all right sir i want to ask one, one more question sir. please yeah please sir, uh, um, uh, after uh, using this catheter uh, should we do after uh, uh, once we disconnected should we flush this catheter with saline or uh, because already ca in catheter there is contrast is there which is too much sticky so immediately to uh, increase the usability we should uh, flush this catheter Absolutely. with saline after so use. so i i mean um, you can you, number one the blood has to be cleared completely 
correct even slightest of contrast is going to make the catheter uh, the terminal rapid exchange you know it kind of crystallizes and it uh, kind of um, the reusability of it comes down so i i also advise that you use a normal water which is which doesn't have so much of sodium so you can use normal water and if in some centers you have distilled water available you can purge a few times with the distilled water the terminal uh, uh, rapid exchange portion so that that would be of uh, help but the blood and the contrast has to be cleared immediately and you need to wipe the entire thing off the main body of the catheter also because um, the terminal rapid exchange uh, can allow the seepage and that, that is the area where most of the problems occur thank you sir. anyone else with anything or shall we proceed Sir, uh, should we take traditional view for ACR or uh, non-overlapping views uh, like for LED rather than epicranial? RU codwell will be better for uh, uh, because it will be less overlapping with uh, circumflex. So, um, the most important uh, thing is that select a view which profiles the lesion the best. So, if I have proximal lesion, I'll be more in the caudal views. If I have a distal lesion or if I have a mid or a long segment disease, I'll be in... Uh, kind of cranial views for a lady. For circumflex, of course, you need to be in the caudal views. In RCA, if you are in PDPLB, you need to be on a AP cranial or a slight LAO cranial. And if you are looking at the proximal, so I mean the view selection is, I mean, most of the operators are oriented. They know which is the view which will open the disease segment the best. So if you want correlation of the OCT with the angiogram, you will, of course, select a view which opens the lesion the best. You know, I would not like to take a caudal view, a leo caudal view for a distal lady disease because I'll be uh, that the basic purpose is lost. What is the basic purpose of angioco registration? The basic purpose is that I have identified disease angiographically in a particular segment of the vessel. I want to see what the OCT looks like. But if I have taken angiocor uh, images where I can't see on angiography the lesion which I want to study. How will I know how, what it looks like on OCT? Basic yes, idea but, is uh, yes. Yeah. yes, sir. Sir, in audio cordial, like uh, maximum LED portion, we can see better. Uh, uh, many times, this proximal LED get overlapped with the uh, branches of circumflex. So, so, Vivek, what is is this Vivek? Yes. I think it is. Vivek. Yes, yes, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, Vivek, one plus one in medicine is never two. It can be eleven. It can be twenty. It can be thirteen, or it can be four. Correct. Yes, yes. So yes, yes. one cannot be dogmatic that I will be using only this view. Yes. yes. Correct. So I, I mean, it has to be dictated by, sorry, I had kept the camera off so I couldn't see you. So it has to be, uh, you know, as per your, as per the profile of the vessel. One cannot say that I will be for a lady, I will use only are you, uh, I mean, we know our field of intervention or medical field is a very, very humbling field. The day you, you know, kind of say that this is this, you get a kick on your backside. So select a view which is uh, kind of, uh, which profiles the lesion the best. Uh, sir, one, if, one, sir, one more question. question. One more question I want to ask, sir. Yeah, please. It may please, be silly. Please. It may be a silly question. No, I don't no. Know. There, there's, Many, I must admit um, that there is no question which is silly. Each and every question Maybe show that is... first. Uh, you know that calibration uh, uh, yes. uh, images. That blue line right. should come properly. You know. Can yes. you show that image again? You know, because most of the time we sure. don't think, look at it when we are doing the intervention. I, I will. I will uh, come at the at the end of my talk. I'll be showing it okay, in the okay, artifact okay. section. I'll be showing yeah, you okay, that. Sir. Very nice. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm very happy that this uh, Dr. Shah, this question has come up. I'll be showing you uh, at the end of the talk how you can go wrong. Okay. okay. Sorry, if I may ask uh, one more question. Ah, uh, please. Considering that uh, there is a mandatory 26 to 30 your, millimeter. Chirag, your audio is very poor. Your audio is poor if you can. Okay. Sir, I'm not able to hear you. Terminal 30 portion, millimeter part of the catheter, which is not used for imaging. 
all right would you and also the trackability of the of dragonfly optus being a bit challenging would you say avoid oct as a imaging modality if the lesion is involving the distal third of the vessel uh, because that is where we face some problems because many a times we cannot uh, the area of importance is too distal for the middle marker to go that far say suppose if you have to do a pd or a plv especially yeah i i i understand your um, handicap but i will tell you any respectable vessel which needs to be stented distally would have a minimum 2.25 to 2.5 mm diameter and if you go by the uh, the general rule fractal rule of coronary diameters so this vessel is going to gradually taper off it will not suddenly taper off so if you've decided to stent a pda which is sizable then it will certainly have a taper which will allow your uh, wire to go distal now the distal the the most distal marker of the oct can climb over your uh, terminal part of the guide wire as long as it does not come out that is the most important thing you know what do i look for i i look for the terminal uh, wire where it has reached and i start threading the oct catheter the uh, the distal most marker can be just near the tip of the wire in distal vessels very nicely it's a very good and a very important uh, question which you put so it it should reach till the end but not come out to the end of the wire because you have only 20 mm and it should not come out even if it straightens the terminal end of the wire absolutely no problem this part of the catheter is really soft and has got a 2.7 french profile it's very uh, small in diameter so it's not going to damage that part of the vessel that much i assure you so it can be there and you can take an image backwards the second important point when you are imaging the distal coronaries is that you need to dilate the lesion before introducing this otherwise it will become flow occlusive and you will not get a good image because now you need a good amount of contrast to get in and clear the segment now having said that the other imaging catheter with other imaging catheters you will find it equally difficult to image the distal part it's not that and in fact a softer catheter like oct is still safer than a rigid catheter which you are going to introduce in the vessel so i i feel more confident introducing oct because it's a softer catheter if it goes distally and i'm reasonably sure that it's not going to create that kind of damage uh, which the, a harder catheter will induce so absolutely be confident take the catheter take the distal most marker till the tip of the uh, wire but ensure that it should not come out of the tip otherwise the catheter will be free you have only 2 cm of uh, length available for the rapid exchange Uh, can i have a question dr chandra please uh, please please uh, sir uh, what are your thoughts about saline oct in a uh, few of the patients who are renally challenged and uh, um, contrast is one of the limitations of oct when compared to an ivus so how do you do that do you do that and what differences does it make uh, and which vessels are better imaged with saline or what are your thoughts on that fantastic and I, i i i was reasonably sure that this issue will certainly come up and uh, i thank dr samir for this question now uh, saline oct is much talked about uh, now let me tell you the limitations of saline oct first and then i'll tell you where i use saline oct major limitation of saline oct is that angioco registration is not possible since you're injecting saline you cannot have an angioco registration because it's not going to show you anything on uh, angiographically you will just see a dot moving backwards number 2 saline oct is not possible in large vessels so if i have a 5 mm left main or a 4 mm uh, lady which is even though if it is diseased and the plaque is plaque burden is not much i despite using a 50 cc saline i will not Is there a signal issue? 
Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, I think just so. Just like too. connecting with Dr. Chaudhary, it seems to be a signal issue with sir. Yeah, hold on for a minute. Hello. So we are able to hear you again now. Uh, you yeah, just have correct. to Sorry. There, there, was, there was a power failure. Yes, sir. Uh, there was a power failure in my complex. Oh. So suddenly the suddenly I got uh, disconnected. No. So sorry. No, sir. No, All right. Sir. So uh, number one, saline OCT we were talking of. So I. In, uh, and registration not possible large vessels absolutely you know usually prices calcified vessels with isr and especially in patients who uh, got borderline renal functions i also use middle path that is i can dilute the uh, contrast with saline but if i dilute the uh, contrast with saline then i need a larger volume so it's it's not that 14 cc is going to serve your purpose so you need double the volume so if i dilute so i i don't know whether i'm reducing the quantity of contrast which is getting into the patient or not if you made make the fluid less viscous so contrast is viscous less and there is a problem the trick which i use in renal uh, dysfunction patients is that i inject first i fill the guider with uh, 5 cc contrast you know what we do when we are doing a puff so the guider is now full of contrast now attach a 30 cc saline and I inject saline. So the initial column of contrast does the clearing and then the saline pushes the uh, uh, blood column, does not let the blood column uh, get into the vessel. So I find this more useful than using diluted uh, contrast. Saline I use only if the disease, the disease segment is tight and the vessel is small. For large vessels, absolutely not. And if I need angioco registration, saline is a big no because you'll have no NGO registration at all. So basically, small vessels and uh, uh, tight lesions and uh, yes. some sort of balance between uh, saline and Absolutely. contrast combination. Thank you. Thank you all so right. much. No, you you try it out in tight vessels and diffuse disease. You will get images. You cannot make out whether it was contrast injected or saline injected you get beautiful images in, Try fact, my first case of, in my first case of oct was a saline oct in a renally challenged rc and was a very very tight lesion and in fact we had to pre-dilate the lesion to negotiate the catheter and when the abbot guy was here he was not able to actually differentiate between a saline and a, a contrast image so there were so good images but uh, yes, uh, limitations are there, and with experienced operators like you, we can learn so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. No, uh, I, I'm glad that I you share my experience on saline OCT, Dr. Samir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I, I think we move on to the next session, which is uh, image interpretation, which is um, uh, very very important um, there, there, there's a fundamental language which we use in the oct which primarily you know is dictated by the uh, uh, the physics behind it so the first terminology we use is backscatter which is nothing uh, in, in if i have to put in a local language is the reflection so it, it is the reflection of the light waves it, the um, we as i told you that oct works on an infrared light source and this light basically gets into the vessel and and this light gets reflected back from the vessel so it, it's just the reflection which we call as uh, backscatter and the the intensity of reflection is dictated by the tissue so you can have high backscatter which means that you have a brighter pixel and it's the lesion then is described as signal rich 
and if the backscatter is um, lesser then we say that it's a signal poor uh, region so you can have a signal rich or a signal poor uh, region depending on the degree of backscatter the second thing which happens with the light is that it can get attenuated that means the light is getting absorbed so it does not get reflected and it gets absorbed so if you have very high attenuation that means the light cannot go through so it's like having a torch and um, and two bottles one bottle having milk and the other bottle having water when you light the torch against the milk the light doesn't go through it gets completely absorbed so there is complete attenuation of light when i put the light source against the milk bottle but the same does not happen when i put it against the uh, cell line so high attenuation means the light cannot penetrate low attenuation means that the light can pass through so two words backscatter and attenuation very very important what's the third term that you use we look at whenever we look at a vessel we look at um, whether the lesion is whether it's got a leading or a trailing edge as is seen on the slide you can see the surface which is closer is the leading edge and the surface which is away is the trailing edge now this becomes very important while describing uh, few um, intraluminal uh, defects we'll see this over a period of time now the uh, basic orientation of the image as you all would know is kind of radial or a cross sectional and um, it, it's kind of a wall clock which is there a wall clock kind of display that's why we use the term that the the, uh, the plaque or the lesion or the vessel shows a uh, plaque at six o'clock, nine o'clock, eight o'clock, the section. So everything is as if you're describing it on a wall clock. The imaging catheter, of course, is seen in the center. You can see the blood vessel, which is uh, the next important thing which you are seeing. You have the guide wire shadow or a meteor, which is uh, seen uh, very, very clearly. And uh, the lumen. Lumen, as you can see in this uh, image, is absolutely uh, clear of blood. You also have a longitudinal uh, mode, or which is called the L mode. Now, this is a very important uh, mode because this is the view which tells you about different branches as to where they are coming. This will also tell you about uh, the lesion or the extent of the lesion, and uh, it helps you in measuring the length of the lesion or the length of the stent which you need to implant. And in some views, it will also show you some morphological changes in disease vessels that you will be able to spot some calcium, you will be able to see intramural hematomas you'll be able to spot some uh, dissections but more importantly this is a view which is um, which is a kind of a stretched view of the uh, vessel and um, where in addition you have when this when you look at this view you will have some distance markers i told you this is a view which is essentially used for measuring the lesion length and this thing you have uh, the proximal and distal marker these two yellow arrows which have emerged on the slide and at the same time you have a depth indicator now this blue thing is the depth which tells you how uh, what exactly is the depth at which it has been imaged and what is the depth of the uh, vessel like so you have a radial cross section and uh, l mode uh, view which is available for both qualitative and quantitative uh, analysis and you have to review the images uh, multiple times and the quality is the key so that you analyze them well and uh, thereafter you move uh, forwards so once you've acquired the image then there are different morphologies which you will uh, get to see so as uh, as shown in the slide you will be able to see um, the different kinds of plaques you can see intraluminal filling defects like thrombi both red and white you will have some changes in the vessel wall primarily pertaining to thin cap fibroatheroma some cholesterol crystal macrophages and plaque ruptures so all these are there but the most important three things are the uh, calcific fibrous and the lipid uh, holes which you need to see so these are called the big threes which you need to understand and orient yourself because majority of the times you'll be concentrating on these three things so let us have a closer look on these uh, lesions so as is true for um, ecgs when we all complete our mbbs we all uh, are kind of you know baptized to reading ecg so 
once you learn what is a normal ECG, you will be easily be able to pick up an abnormal ECG. So the first and the most important thing is to learn as to how and what are the normal structures which constitute a normal blood vessel wall. So the uh, image here uh, shows you a normal blood vessel and you can see in the magnified uh, image the all the details which you need to see such as the magnification of uh, the OCT that it will show you the intima, it will show you the uh, media and the adventitia and so much so that it can also show you the internal and the external elastic lamina. So I, I, I mean it, it is phenomenal. So you need to appreciate all these structures because all your um, measurements are going to be both based on that and tomorrow when we have an interactive case-based uh, learning we'll see as to how we chase and pick the eel for doing all our uh, measurements and uh, so one has to get oriented and one has to find out as to uh, the normal segments because your proximal and distal references are going to be dictated by the normal uh, vessel uh, configuration or normal vessel uh, morphology well uh, i think this is one lesion which most of the cardiologists start picking up after doing one or two octs a calcific plaque uh, uh, this really stands out on uh, oct you have uh, the deep superficial calcium as displayed on this image a heterogeneous appearance with uh, low back scatter that means the reflections are going to be very less and uh, light will be going all around it so that's why you can see a heterogeneous uh, structure which is will have very very sharp borders so very well defined sharp uh, borders and they appear in the form of islands or they can be concentric uh, rings you can see two islands or you can see a kind of concentric ring of thin plate uh, calcium on the image on the lower left uh, part well, and if you have a very homogeneous appearing structure with very high back scatter, it could be intimal thickening or it could be a fibrous uh, plaque. What differentiates these two is the thickness. So we uh, use the term pathological intimal thickening if the thickness is around 600 micron or less. But if it is more than that, we use the term uh, fibrotic plaque. So uh, I, I mean, need not go into these details but increased reflection is a marker of either intimal thickening and if it progresses it increases it could be fibrotic plaque and if all if this is happening secondary to a stent implantation then it is an isr now vis-a-vis -vis this the third uh, important morphology which you need to pick is the lipid plaque which is kind of homogeneous so calcium is heterogeneous that means it will have few bright spots but this will be homogeneous. This will have low backscatter. That means that the light is going to get completely absorbed. So if I put a torch against a bottle of milk, I see nothing. Same thing happens. The infrared light just shows you the surface. You know, you will have uh, basically diffuse the shadowy edges vis-a-vis -vis calcium plaque, which has got very sharp, well-defined edges because the light is going all around. There is low attenuation. Here, there is very high attenuation of the light. So you can't see, you see the um, the images in both the ends, they have been inverted images of the same vessel you, uh, at different points. So you see that there is absolutely diffuse and you can't see the edges at all. So I use milk, the terminology on the slide is murky water. So I mean, both mean the same, you will not be able to flash the light through these. So um, the lesion characteristic, you need to see whether there is a back, high back scatter or a low back scatter. Thereafter, whether the attenuation is low or high, if the attenuation is low and there are sharp edges, it is. if it is heterogeneous, it is calcium. If it is homogeneous, it is a lipidic plaque. And if you have a high backscatter homogeneous, then it becomes a fibrous uh, plaque. Now, vis-a-vis -vis these, the intraluminal defects are slightly different. You can have white thrombus or a, a red thrombus. The red thrombus is the one which has a very high backscatter at the leading edge and high attenuation beyond the leading edge. So this at the surface, because there are fibrin deposits, you will have increased the reflection. Beyond that, you will not be able to see anything. Correct? So these are three different images of red thrombus, which we see a lot in uh, patients with ACS. You might as, as well see the red thrombus if your heparin uh, 
load is less or if you induce dissection and uh, there is uh, some amount of clotting of blood which is happening but vis-a-vis -vis this the white thrombus is kind of platelet rich it is homogeneous and you can see all around the uh, white thrombus a very common site post uh, rotablation or post balloon dilatation you will see or if you're de dealing with a calcified lesion if you've done high pressure balloon dilatation you'll have small um, white thrombi sticking on wherever you induce dissection that means the endothelial lining is broken you will have the platelets coming and sticking on so you will have high back scatter throughout with very low attenuation that means the light is able to go all around whereas in red thrombus there is very high attenuation except you will have in high back scatter from the surface but thereafter there will be complete attenuation of light which is not the case in white thrombus well um, this is a typical acs um, uh, uh, case where you can see the thrombus protrusion from the uh, stent struts a very common sight and i think most of you would have seen this this also qualifies as plaque prolapse or thrombus prolapse um, you have the image of metallic uh, stents and the these metallic stents you know, whether they are optimally deployed well opposed or mal opposed two images of the same so you can see the guide wire well opposed stent and a mal opposed uh, stent so uh, mal opposed stent will pro probably be seen as um, the stent uh, not well opposed to the vessel wall as it goes by the definition but in machine it the machine will pick it up and show you i will show you tomorrow as to how the machine tells you any opposition any distance between the stent struck in the vessel wall more than 400 microns will immediately be highlighted will automatically be highlighted by the machine as malapposition you can have neoentomal growth post stent implantation so uh, when this neoentomal growth becomes too much it gets qualified as uh, isr and you can have some different configurations of a vulnerable plaque you can have thin cap fibroatheroma if the thickness of the cap is less than 65 micron you can have lipid rich plaque you can see some micro channels as is seen in the image c you can have macrophages you can have spotty calcium it is essentially these spotty calcium which meet and they form a calcific plate and these calcific plates will grow over a period of time forming calcific sheets and multiple calcific sheets coming together can protrude into the lumen forming uh, protrusive uh, nodules so I, I mean, it, it's a complete spectrum and uh, one and a half hours is too lesser time for this. But I mean, I'm just sensitizing you. You can also pick up cholesterol crystals, which are uh, really very bright pixel images, which you get on your uh, frame. If the vessel wall is damaged, you can et get edge dissections, which could be intimal or it can extend on to the media. And if it is, it goes beyond that, you can have intramural hematoma images of all the three on your uh, screen any dissection no this is a very important question which comes up whether we need to treat the dissection or not any angiographically visible dissection merits attention and merits uh, treatment um, majority of the times angiography is going to mix miss the dissection and if you see dissection on oct when should you treat you should treat if the arc is more than 60 degrees or if the longitudinal extent is more than three millimeters or if the dissection is extending onto media. Needless to say that all intramural hematomas will need uh, attention, depending on the extent to which they have occurred in the vessel wall. Small intimal tears like this can also be visualized and they are best left alone. You don't need to treat such small intimal uh, uh, tears. Uh, this is an image of a thin cap uh, fibroatheroma where the absolutely about to rupture and once it rupture it leads to formation of uh, the thrombus over the surface it's the lipid pool which uh, kind of uh, is uh, the inciting factor it leads to a lot of thrombin local thrombin generation and you will have very soon a clot formation and as i told you the um, classification is based on the thickness of the fibrous cap whether it's 65 micron uh, or below you can have spontaneous dissection and this spontaneous dissections um, basically show intramural hematoma now the most important thing here to remember is that 
when do we call it spontaneous uh, dissection when we don't see any plaque burden in the vessel wall you can see the normal media here and there is hardly any plaque burden generally seen in females you can have type 1 2 3 dissections again not in the purview of the talk but this is how you say that this is a spontaneous coronary dissection and not induced by a plaque rupture then uh, there is a complete spectrum of uh, isrs which you get to see you can have different patterns you can have a layered pattern layered pattern means that this is generally seen in patients with acs you have a layer of thrombus and the endothelium grows and there's kind of a layered appearance of uh, the plaque you can have a patchy pattern which is more neoatherosclerotic you can have a speckle where there is both lipid as well as the uh, calcific pool which is there and these are the images of calcific and lipidic uh, plaques which are there you can have in a neoatherosclerotic plaque thin cap fibroatheromas again because these are the lipid deposits which are against the uh, fibrous cap which is about to rupture you can also see some micro vessels uh, forming in them and as we all know that this kind of uh, the spectrum which you see is um, probably seen uh, in patients with drug eluting stents with the bare metal stents all this is not seen and if the person has got uh, stented twice or thrice you can see as in 4C, you can see the overlapping uh, stent uh, struts there. Now, the extent of restenosis will be kind of uh, be variable. It can be eccentric or concentric. Generally, if you have a bare metal stent related restenosis, it will be kind of a concentric uh, intimal hyperplasia. Whereas with the DES, it will be kind of eccentric because and the point at which the drug eluting stent is well opposed will be able to inhibit the intimal uh, growth but at the other points if it is not well uh, opposed it will not inhibit so there will be kind of heterogeneity in the growth of the uh, uh, intimal uh, tissue along with the other things which come along with it now a very important question which comes up is how do these two modalities compare you know oct has been riding on the back of ivas ivas was the first modality which it laid the foundation of imaging in the coronary intervention and it kind of proved that if you image an implant a stent, you are assured of good end results. So how do these two modalities compare? We know that um, image, as I've been telling you, is light-based, whereas IVAS is sound-based. You need to clear the blood column with OCT, which is not required there because you're using the sound wave, so you are absolutely fine. The pullback is about 20 times faster with OCT and the axial resolution is considerably better. Whereas tissue penetration, since it's a light-based uh, modality, the tissue penetration is not very good. So that means if you have larger vessels, OCT is not going to image them uh, well. The scan diameter is kind of uh, comparable, but the lateral and the uh, lateral sampling and the axial resolution is about 10 times higher of oct so you get very nice magnified images so if you need to learn about the surface details oct is the modality but if you need an in-depth analysis if you need to look at the larger vessel ivas is the uh, tool to be used now the other differences primarily stem from the fact that i told you that um, the resolution is 10 times better. That means both the axial and the lateral resolution of OCT is 10 times better. So you get very nice magnified surface details of the vessel. The pullback speed is 20 times higher and um, the image acquisition is 40 times higher. So in three seconds, you will get plethora of information. Many a times you will be at loss as to how do I handle this kind of information. So you have to be a little discreet and you have to be intelligent to analyze and then uh, proceed. So it gives you lots more than what IWAS uh, gives you. And in terms of its accuracy, it is much better because the phantom models have shown that the measurements on OCT are akin to what you get um, while using the phantom models, whereas IVAS size is about 8% higher. Well, the surface details, malopposition, stentage, dissection, thrombus, tissue prolapse, everything is fantastic with OCT and uh, IVAS misses out on all this. Now, let's compare a few plaques as to how they look. So, uh, calcific plaque between uh, 6 o'clock to say about 11 o'clock or maybe 12 o'clock here and um, see the ivus ivus is not going to give you the 
depth of the plug. I, in OCT, I can see the how thick this calcific plug is, but with IWAS, what happens is that the the sound waves are going to get reflected from the surface, so I really don't know what is the thickness of this plug. So I'll not be able to uh, measure the thickness. Similar thing, you have a concentric plug. You can easily measure. Now see between six o'clock to nine o'clock the thickness. You know, if I have IWAS and if I get an image like this, I will say, okay, take out a um, NC balloon or take out a cutting balloon and I'll be able to crack this. Becomes difficult. You see the thickness here, it's about more than a millimeter or so. So OCT gives you the thickness. It's a very distinct advantage of OCT. And uh, it really uh, is a tool because this OCT only will tell you about the thickness of the plaque, which is not possible with uh, IVAS. Now let's look at few case examples of surface details. Now there is um, a fibrotic plaque and look at the IVAS image. We cannot really make out to a very great extent what exactly is it and look at the OCT image. It gives you complete morphology of the plaque with thickness and you can see a micro channel at around 11 o'clock uh, position. Now once you've implanted the stent and you have overlapping uh, stents, it's it's very well uh, seen with the IVAS and you can see here uh, with the OCT, you can see here the two stent struts overlapping with each other. It becomes slightly difficult uh, with the IVAS. Now, if you have an ISR, uh, again, the plaque morphology superficially is much better with OCT. But if I have an underexpanded stent, which is deep down into the tissue, I will pick it up much better with the IVAS because it's got greater depth compared to the OCT. So under expansion of a previously uh, implanted stent or sizing of a previously implanted stent is much better with IVAS vis-a-vis um, OCT. Well, needless to say about the uh, surface details, um, that is malaposition, dissections, uh, plug prolapse, nothing, nothing will be seen on IVAS, but OCT by virtue of giving you magnified images will see you, uh, will show you all well the need to the uh, artifacts and i'll be just touching upon uh, a very few there are multiple imaging artifacts which can be there but I, I thought since it's a basic course so let's look at few of them this is something which i think all of you all would have uh, seen the blood swirls the catheter is not coaxial you've injected the contrast and the clearing is not right and you'll see blood swirls and if you use saline you will see some speckles now the basic premise of all this is that the uh, infrared light wavelength is smaller than the size of the RBC. So it gets reflected from individual RBCs. So it creates, if there's too much of blood, you'll have a swirl. And if there is little less blood, then you'll have speckling, which happens. So this is not the case with IVAS because IVAS has got a very large wavelength. The sound wave uh, has got a larger wavelength and it's able to kind of overcome the uh, filling defects because of the RBCs. So you need to flush, you need to see that your guide is coaxial, you need to uh, inject at the right uh, intensity and um, you need to push the uh, contrast uh, well. And the timing, if you're using an automatic mode, the timing of the trigger and the OCT has to be absolutely uh, right. Otherwise, if you have these swirls and speckles, your uh, uh, the capability of the OCT, the main power of OCT of giving you surface details will be completely lost and you'll not be able to make out the plaque uh, morphology. Well, uh, there are some other blood related things. If the blood has seeped into the catheter, the image will become absolutely uh, dim. That means you've not uh, purged and um, you can also see some rotating defects. So this shows you as to uh, the image, uh, the the inner lumen completely uh, filled with uh, blood. So you need to purge this before you acquire the image. Otherwise, you'll get a very dim image. And if there is partial filling, then you'll see a, a filling defect uh, rotating in your uh, axial images. Uh, the other thing which you also often notice is that when you are injecting and if you've stopped injecting uh, and the flush media is not cleared out, you will see a kind of blood at the end of the flush and the lumen completely will uh, collapse and it will appear to you as if the vessel wall has 
collapsed or you've got a red thrombus. No, it is not so. It is just that you've not flushed it uh, well towards the end of your uh, injection. Now you can have um, the system uh, related uh, rings and uh, you can have a mild ring. That means uh, what happens is there is a small reflection as you see here. So, um, sorry, did I press? Okay, I went up instead of coming down. And uh, this kind of shows the that the table is not right. And there was one question which Of course, the beginning of the talk was in terms of calibration, which kind of have to be hugging the catheter for it to be uh, proper. The measurements are going to go for a six because the, there is a small. Ring has a mild ring which has come. Now, this is you know, the stream ring is that yellow, you know, the right side of your uh, this thing. I think, sir, if and you because can, I'm sure uh, break and a connection, don't so use connection your some video, form, ima video problem. images. So the images. So you, you need stop your video and keep on speaking. I think that would uh, to be make careful. It yeah, no, no. Uh, I mean, it requires more of data if you are using video as well as audio. Hello. So if you stop your video and use your audio, probably we'll be able to hear you. No, wait a sec. Give me a. No, 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 no. I, I was using my. I will go on to. I'll stop. There's been a power break, so. How's it now? Sir, it's uh, visible and uh, you're audible as well. Okay, I've, I've, I've just connected to the home network, so I switched Sounds off the mobile thank, because there were a couple of calls coming. All right, all right. Now, I, 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 from which point do you want me to repeat? From this slide on? Sir, do please uh, explain the entire slide again properly because we missed many of okay, your audio fine. signals at that time, you know. All right, fine. Sorry. Sorry about that. You know, this is called Murphy's Law. Whatever, whenever has to go wrong. And this is the first time there has been a power failure in our complex. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Okay. Uh, uh, is this slide clear? Blood related? Yes. Um, yes. Yes, oh, sir. Yes. Fine. Sir. Okay. Now, now let's come to the system related. So there's something called, which is called um, ring formation. You know, you can have a mild ring or uh, extreme ring formation. Now, this is primarily linked to damage to the optical fiber cable of the catheter. The mild ring is something like this. I'll show you a magnified image of the same. You, what you see is the yellow arrow points to a, a ring which is formed on the outer surface. Now, the calibration markers are not optimally situated. So what has happened is that the calibration markers have moved slightly towards the outer ring. They are not hugging the catheter. So the catheter is not properly calibrated at this stage. You know, 
this was a question which i was asked at the beginning in the first session that is the catheter how do one how does one ensure so you have to look at these four blue dots and they have to be hugging the catheter that means you calibrated it well that means they they will they, the measurements are going to be accurate you know otherwise the measurements become inaccurate and when you have an extreme ring and this is what you see with the red arrow and a yellow thing happening the image will become kind of dim and you will find a big ring coming on the image and you can have multiple such rings coming if the catheter has been uh, damaged uh, very badly if the fiber cable has been damaged badly and the image uh, will become absolutely dim so this is what happens when you don't put back the catheter the, in the hoof in between the uh, runs so whenever you take one run tell the assistant the hoof there is a standard practice of rolling the catheter and putting a bowl of saline on top so that it doesn't open up or doesn't fall down but this can damage the fiber this can damage the fiber so put it back in the hoof then and there only now you can have also a sew up or a stitch up uh, artifact which is primarily linked to the motion motion of the vessel if you have extremely tortuous vessel or if you have a catheter which is reused and it kind of rotates more faster than uh, and is not synchronized so in the lumen scan you the catheter moves and since the catheter moves and it shifts its uh, position you'll feel as if there is a stitch up or the vessel is broken at that uh, part or the uh, certain part of the vessel is kind of disconnected no the vessel is not disconnected so it acquired a round image here and another image and these overlapping images are not falling at the same point so they have kind of axially shifted so there is a shift in the artery as you can see here and the shift in the artery kind of gives an impression as if there is a break in the uh, vessel uh, wall so this is called a sewer part effect or a stitch up part effect you need to acquire the image again or maybe change the catheter and now these are uh, things which can happen if you really damage your lens fiber or you cause break so these are extreme so this is an extreme ring which is formed here this is an extreme uh, ring so you kind of damage so if you see any of these things please change the catheter you need to change because you will absolutely not get um, any kind of image which will be uh, interpretable so replace with a new catheter immediately otherwise you are wasting your uh, time well I, I stop for a couple of minutes here if there are any doubts on this and then we go on to the last part of the talk which is software interface sir one uh, one question sir i want to ask you yeah in please. young patients in young patients who come with acs and when we do this oct how do you actually differentiate that plaque rupture and that erosion of the plaque you know because that this will dictate the treatment for that particular patient in the absence of severe atherosclerosis so is it very easy or it is quite difficult sir for so me it is difficult because i did the uh, ocd no. today in such a patient i found it difficult to can you, Not, can you, sir, you have I, will, I will i will tell you what this i i will try and explain it in um, a minute or so but this uh, needs to be shown on a basis of case examples yes, and I, um, I have um, at least one hour of uh, talk on this because i have shown oh, multiple oh. case examples but broadly i will tell you something if someone has come with acs and you've done an angiogram and the um, the vessel is studded with thrombi so window period is very important if someone has come late and if you see multiple thrombi and kind of organized clot i normally put these patients on triple therapy and get them back i don't stent organized thrombus at all because stenting squeezes thrombi further it will squeeze the thrombus and you are at the end of the day you are opening an epicardial channel to ensure the health of the micro channels micro channels are going to determine the health of the myocardium so if you sludge the micro channels with thrombi the game is lost you will have a very nicely flowing blood vessel but at the end of the day he will continue to have severe lv dysfunction and he'll live with an open artery but he will have lv dysfunction 
Number two, when the vessel is completely studded with organized thrombus, it's not a good idea to do OCT because it will add very little information. Number three, I would not know the extent of disease from where it has happened and to what extent it is going. Generally speaking, the broad difference between a plaque rupture and erosion is that erosions are common in young individuals who are primarily, in my practice, I have known to be smokers. They will have distal normal looking vessel and proximally the, there will be a cloud buildup which will be like a clot buildup which will appear on OCT like a cloud, a, a cloud which is forming. And then distally on OCT, you will see the vessel will be absolutely normal and will be as pristine as you see a vessel being displayed on the screen right now. So the disease burden is going to be very less. Now at the extremes of age, non-STEMIs also produce a lot of plaque erosions. Then in those patients, you will have a variable morphology, but these patients will be elderly. Since you brought the topic of a young individual, young individuals will have plaque erosions, which will partially occlude the vessel. But if you see the MLA big enough, just leave these patients on DAPT. And if you see thrombus burden to be more, put them for four weeks on an additional anticoagulant. What I do is vitamin K antagonist with clopid sprint. Leave them for four weeks, get them back, repeat an angio. Everything will disappear. And if it is secondary to a plaque erosion, or if it is secondary to a plaque rupture, OCT at the end of four weeks will completely show you where the plaque was located, which has ruptured and how ugly it looks now. But so I will tell you for each, each ruptured plaque, there are millions of unruptured plaques which are there. And for each large ruptured plaque, there are millions of small ruptured plaques. So there is a process of continuous healing which takes place in the vessel. So you should, if the MLA is large enough, you should not be scared of leaving this plaque alone. It is going to heal over a period of time. You have to just ensure that the platelets are not active enough to stick onto that patch and initiate the coagulation cascade. So if your antiplatelet okay. therapy is right, you can just leave them alone. So you suggest that if they are young patients, then better leave them, don't do this intravascular imaging, keep them on antiplatelets, antithrombotic, and then if required, do it after three to four weeks. Absolutely. Is that right, sir? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thrombus burden is going to dictate the imaging. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Chadda, sir, can I ask a question? Uh, please, 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 please. Very lucid presentation. Excellent sir. lecture. I have learned a lot. I have two questions, sir. One is, sir. can you for sure differentiate between neoatherosclerosis and neointimal hyperplasia because it's very important in case of maybe we will probably cover this tomorrow. So if you are going to cover it tomorrow, you, you may not answer it now. So I, I will I will um, answer it now and I will show some case examples tomorrow. And for your sakes, I'm going to modify the slides and add um, uh, OCT images of intimal hyperplasia. And I, it's kind of natural history, sir. When you implant a stent, if the stent is not acceptable, the first thing which happens is neointimal hyperplasia. Now, this neointimal hyperplasia subsequently undergoes further evolution. You will have micro channels, you will have lipid deposits which are going to come. So, these lipid deposits and the micro channels, they basically transform the hypertrophied intima into a neoatherosclerotic plaque, which in 90% of the cases is going to be a lipidic plaque. And in about 5 to 10 percent, it might become calcified. So the neointima now becomes calcific. Calcific neointima generally is seen in patients who, in whom the stent was implanted on a calcific background. That means there was native coronary artery calcification. And then once you've implanted the stent, these patients have a tendency to form calcific plaques. So the neointima which is forming post stenting will also get calcified. So ISR is basically there is intimal hyperplasia, which over a period of time, because it is diffuse variable and the normal endothelial functions have been suppressed, more lipids get deposited and that leads to formation of neointima in an atherosclerotic segment of a vessel, which forms what is called neoatherosclerotic plaque in the milieu of a stented uh, vessel, and this is called a neoatherosclerotic uh, plaque. This was the first question which you asked, and the second yeah. question I forgot. The second question is, sir, uh, high backscatter uh, causes the bright uh, shadows? 
like uh, thrombotic uh, thrombus in the artery. Sir, so the new, atheros new atherosclerotic plaques will be akin to a normal atherosclerotic changes in a vessel, except that you will be able to spot stent struts around and the neoentomal tissue is going to be considerably thicker. So there can be a variability in the thickness of the neoatherosclerotic plaque, which is very common with the drug eluting stent. So what you will see is lipid deposits, which will appear um, as if there is a lipid plaque which is developing in the segment it becomes very difficult to differentiate it from the micro channels only thing that these lipid deposits are going to be much bigger than the uh, micro channels on the surface as you rightly pointed out the, there will be very high back scatter but you will be able to get around these lipid plaques you will be able to see the distal end because there is a stent which is there uh, behind but if these lipid pools become larger you will not be able to spot the stent struts in that particular segment. Okay. okay, sir. Thank you very much. Right, sir. All right, then I'll go to the last part of the talk, which is the, the software um, interface. Uh, now, this is um, a kind of a short uh, segment. So this is how um, a normal display which you will get on the uh, machine and um, this is extremely user friendly and you have to just stand uh, in front of this and um, you have to play with it. You have to play with the buttons and um, I was kind of motivated in the first phase of my OCT learning. I was more concentrated on the images and I would um, uh, you know, kind of focus only on the image and this, but my dear friend uh, Jagdish motivated me to stand behind the machine and play with the buttons. So I must thank him for this because he was the one who introduced uh, me to the different tools which are available and it, it is uh, very, very educated. So if, if I start from uh, the, uh, uh, say around 11 o'clock position, you have a measurement toolbar and you have an advanced, uh, uh, feature toolbars the art as a, a slanting eye and a and a eye which is there in the in the advanced toolbar it's an eye which is being made we come to the functions of these then you have uh, the uh, strength planning or the optimization uh, tool which is available which tells you automatically what all measurements that you have uh, taken you have a lumen profile which is very important and uh, uh, this lumen profile is going to uh, very rapid eyeballing. It's going to tell you whether the stenosis has been overcome or not. And it will have some markers coming, which will uh, uh, indicate the uh, position post stenting, whether the, uh, the stent is malopposed or well opposed. Then you have the longitudinal uh, section, which, as I told you earlier, is uh, kind of marked and is um, is scaled so that you can measure the length of the lesion and the length of these stents which have been uh, implanted. You have the menu or the setup button which helps you select certain uh, functions which we'll see uh, tomorrow. And um, you have the co-registration button, the image acquisition button. You can end the review. So each section will have one review. So when you end the review, it will take you back to the multiple reviews which you've taken to the patient. You can select the um, other reviews. You have the uh, bookmark toolbar, which is uh, located here. The bookmark uh, toolbar is you uh, identify and then you drop a bookmark so that now you know that this is my distal reference. So you can then scale and uh, measure. Then you have the cross sectional view, which is uh, coming here. You have the OCT toolbar at around uh, one o'clock uh, position. This uh, when you press on this and this will uh, give you the length and uh, the area measurement uh, which is possible. And at the same time, when you are acquiring these images and you find something interesting, you can um, just press on a button and um, the uh, image can be stored. And this is uh, located uh, close to the uh, top of the uh, panel. So everything is self-explanatory. All you need to do is that Get the mouse in your hand and press the buttons and you will uh, learn. Now this is angioco registration. So you see the angiogram of a given vessel on the left top. You see a 
cross sectional uh, sorry cross sectional uh, image so you need to go on to the button which is now highlighted the co register once you co registered you acquire the angiogram once you have acquired the angiogram this is what we have done for the led then you have to mark it from moving uh, from the distal to the uh, proximal end and once you marked it and you are uh, reasonably sure and you come till the end of the catheter tip you press the button and you confirm it once you confirmed you'll see a white round toolbar as you can see in this image moving backwards that yes you've done this and you find that this is correct you go ahead and press this blue button which is at the bottom that is you accept so you've accepted the co registration once you've accepted the co registration it's going to be stored now as and now this is without co registration you have three section you have a cross section you have a lumen profile and you have a longitudinal mode so is very important as you see in the lumen profile here lumen profile you see small red dot in the middle now this small red dot in the lumen profile indicates that there is a branch which is coming out so if you have multiple septals and diagonals coming out you will have multiple red dots and you see a red dot here proximally this tells you that this is the point from where the circumflex is coming out so this it's very important to orient oneself to these uh, images now you can rotate this uh, toolbar and as you rotate you will be able to see a change in the longitudinal profile at times you feel that this vessel is broken and it's not complete moment you rotate you will not only see the vessel complete but you will also see different branches coming out generally the diagonals and septals will be in the opposite uh, direction and it's very important to select a view where you will be able to see the uh, branches originating now you have this automatic measurement which uh, comes in now this basically is a measurement which has taken the lumen it has basically measured the lumen of the vessel because the system is not devised to detect the el so it has not uh, done with that so this was the first button which i was telling you i is for the measurements and then you have a i which is like what we have the i and now this has multiple uh, functions in this as you can see you have co registration 3d bifurcation 3d navigation l mode lumen profile everything you click on any of these given buttons and they will come on the display so if you press on angio co registration you get an angio co registration uh, image so it's as easy as that you go to 3d bifurcation you press on that you get 3d image you can see the guide wire inside and the lumen or the side branches get um, uh, seen as a pink or a complete um, really um, I, I mean as is seen here if you go on a rendered view the the origin of the side branches will be highlighted with a pink uh, border well this is uh, the circumflex origin which is seen here and then you go to 3d navigation which we often use for checking the stent deposition or uh, this thing you can do a fly through view in the 3d navigation mode and then you this is one view which the um, operators are very fond of it's like flying through the uh, vessel as to how it looks and during this you can also select on the left uh, as i go on the right side you have a panel which comes up and you go into 3d navigation and you press on this and you will be able to generate the rendered stent views you will be also be able to now having seen this uh, rendered image you come back to the actual measurements so we go on to the toolbar which is on the right of the panel and this will give you a, a length where you can now using this toolbar i am going to select initially i can i am measuring the area i am kind of drawing a circle once the circle is complete i have to press the button except and i get uh, the area derived uh, diameter so i get maximum and minimum diameter along with the areas now the other thing which i can uh, do is again now i select length and when i select the length i can if i am able to identify the el i'll measure the el so what you get is uh, the system measured um, dimension which is essentially lumen based and as you can see the two dimension 2.9 2.8 which i have got now is slightly more than the lumen based uh, measurement i can also measure the length of the stent because i have put my markers for the proximal and distal reference so uh, this is how i measure the length of the stent which is to be 
implanted. So in this given case, I need, I measured 43. So maybe I'll select a 48 millimeter stand for addressing this vessel. So I, I mean, it's as simple as this. The more you play around with the buttons, the more comfortable you'll get with the machine and the more information you'll be able to derive from the um, machine. Well, you have other um, uh, information parameters which are uh, available. So these are the proximal and distal uh, markers which give you the area. The maximum uh, minimum luminal area also gets highlighted automatically and will tell you where uh, uh, the minimal uh, luminal area is located. You have the proximal and distal reference, everything all, all automatically um, coming out. You can mark the vessel where you acquired. It becomes very uh, important of, if you have to dig out your data and uh, correlate at a later date. So you should specify there which vessel and which part of the vessel you have been interrogating. So I have kind of slightly rushed through the last part because I thought I'm exceeding the time limit and I wanted to make it more interactive. So I'm still open for um, any questions which you would have. And we'll certainly have a brief recap of all this uh, tomorrow. So that was a beautiful presentation, you know. This we are not seen and heard before, you know. So we have learned a lot okay, and I uh, hope that tomorrow's lecture would be still much more interesting than what you will be using all what you have shown us today. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. That was a pretty good, sir. Uh, Dr. Chanda, again, echoing the same uh... I would say thoughts by my previous colleague. It has been an excellent presentation and uh, always a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a question about the uses of uh, nitroglycerin in your cases. Do you do it very frequently, regularly, uh, especially for imaging? And what is your protocol? Is Dr. Chadda connected? So we see that there is some bandwidth issue with him. Just let me connect with him once up, please. Give me a minute. Thank you. Just wanted to ask uh, my colleague. I don't think so. The current equipment allows us to do core registrations that comes from Abbott to us to our routine lab. Do we need to have a separate software or something? That feature in the cath lab, not in the OCT machine. So, do we need to have a software in the lab or something? Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I was kind of disconnected. There was some internet uh, problem. Uh, so I didn't get the question. Can, can the question be repeated, please? So I had a question about the usage of nitroglycerin, uh, especially while imaging, the coaxiality of the catheter and uh, the usage of vasodilators. I mean, some tips and tricks, I mean, some basic things to acquire good images, uh, can you just dwell upon that because such an experienced operator, so you can give us some uh, those kind of tips. So, um, um, the most important thing is that the guide catheter has to be coaxial. Now, there are, this is the most important thing. And you know what happens? There is a kind of relative motion of the guide catheter and the OCT catheter. So when you push it, the guide catheter kind of comes back. And this is especially when you're using a guiding catheter, which is slightly uh, smaller. I mean, it's not kind of getting into the uh, vessel. So if my guide is sitting just at the tip and I push my OCT catheter, it can just prolapse out. And I pull the guiding, if I pull the OCT catheter, it kind of prolapses in. So if these are the kind of moments which are happening, and if I'm not careful and if I'm not taken that puff before I acquire the image, I can have very poor quality images. 
So just make sure that when you puff, you check angiographically as well as on the OCT image that there is some amount of clearance which is happening and the person who's supporting you with the OCT should be able to alert you that yes I can see the clearance. Now when we give the puff the way of giving puff is very important. The puff has to be given in a small jerk. You inject 2 ml very hard so that you inject only 2 ml and it goes like a with more force so what we manage with the power injector is that we are able to uniformly flush the guide fast so the same thing you should do with this syringe when you're giving a puff so that you generate a lot of force otherwise if you will give a small slow injection it will not show you the clearance and you'll not be sure whether everything is fine or not that is one number two it is if hemodynamics permit it is always a good idea to use NTG prior to injection. You must give NTG. It causes some amount of vasodilatation and you will be um, able to, you know, kind of uh, have a larger vessel uh, for interrogation. Number three, for beginners, I always advocate use a seven French guide because the injection, if you're doing a manual or if you're using an injector, the injection becomes easier. And number three, if you're dealing with a very tight, number four, if you're dealing with a very tight lesion, it is always, it is mandatory to dilate with the two millimeter balloon and then put in the OCT catheter to acquire the images. One of the issues with saline is that saline is a vasoconstrictor and so you need to use NTG more religiously while doing a, a saline OCT. And one of my colleagues told me not to look at the Cine screen, but to look at the OCT screen because we don't have angiographic co-registration. So when we are injecting, really the eye should be at the OCT screen rather than at the angio, angio screen. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and professor. those who are fond of using saline, I would advocate use a 50 cc syringe for saline. You know, don't use 30 or 50. Use a, you'll need a larger volume. So use a larger volume. So I, I mean, uh, yeah, please. Uh, professor Sita, there was one question we missed in between uh, from Dr. Zakia Khan. She was asking, uh, currently in their center, we are providing with the demo machines. So what is the role of ACR? Like in demo machines, uh, we don't have ACR. So just wanted you to address them, you know. Uh, that was her question because they were not able to use ACR. When in, we know. Yeah. Okay. okay, Dr. Zakia, you, you shouldn't be disappointed that you don't have uh, ACR. In my practice over more than a decade, I would have used ACR in 10% of cases because even I've been deprived, but um, I mean, and there are now clinical studies which have shown that uh, ACR is very user friendly. It is very helpful, but ACR has not kind of uh, changed the clinical outcomes when there is a very nice publication in uh, Cath Cardiovascular where they compared ACR and non-ACR based image acquisition. So at the end of the day, the image which you acquire, the quality of image and its interpretation is much more important. So you shouldn't get disappointed that you don't have an ACR with you and you're not able to kind of have ACR. ACR makes you, definitely makes your job easier. ACR makes you very well oriented to the anatomy and it tells you uh, the extent of disease, the severity of disease in terms of your strength selection options and uh, this thing but if you don't have don't get disappointed you still uh, will generate uh, uh, the image which will give you a plethora of information and you will be able to size your stent size your uh, select the right length and even now in the manipal hospitals we are using a non acr based machine we'll soon have a acr based uh, machine so i mean i'm practically not much of difference yes it does handicap you in terms of orientation but don't get disappointed Please continue to use non-ACR based machine and um, uh, it should not affect your practice uh, big way. Near. Yeah, good evening, Savan. Good to have you around. Uh, thank you. Uh, if may I add with your permission uh, to that question yeah, of Dr. Zakia. Uh, for demo machine, basically, we will not be able to install the ACR in the cath lab because that needs a permanent setup. So for the demo machine, since it is moving around, if the hospital has its own setup, 
then uh, we can actually have the ACR because that needs a permanent uh, cat lab uh, setting up with the cables and all. Uh, it is not only software, it also hardware because you need to acquire the NGO. Okay. So what okay. we basically okay. do, we take the NGO feed and we need to do the cabling inside the cat lab. So okay. that's okay. why we cannot have in the demo setup, demo machine, we will not be able to provide ACR. Sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, Tata, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, please, 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 Dr. Sir. Uh, uh, I mean, OCT is fantastic. It gives so much of information, nice images, nice views, and sometimes you see much, much more than what you actually require to see also. So what are the conditions wherein you would actually recommend that OCT has changed your practice in a dramatic way, something like calcium or whatever. I mean, wherein you would say, Keep, please try and do it always with an OCT. What are those cases? All right. Um, number one is um, this left main. Number two is bifurcation. Number three is calcium. I mean, it's not in a chronological order. And number four is stent failure. So these are four situations where OCT is mandatory. Stent failure, left main, bifurcation, and uh, calcium. It is unmatched. Now, in left main segment, I specifically said uh, distal left main. Posterior left main, there is a handicap with OCT. I do with uh, Guidezilla and Guide Support, but I will not strongly advocate um, OCT for the osteo left main disease. I was definitely scores. The other handicap of OCT in the left main segment is uh, the depth. You know, the o OCT works around 2, 2.5 or maybe 3. So if you have a large left main, you will not be able to assess the pluck burden. You will not be able to assess the uh, uh, whether it really merits a stent or it does not merit a stent. So I mean, OCT does have handicap in the osteal segment. But for distal left main, OCT is unmatched. For bifurcation, it is unmatched. Bifurcation, it scores in multiple ways over uh, the other modalities. It tells you not only about the um, bifurcation anatomy, it tells you about the uh, wire recross, it tells you about the neocarina which you've created, it tells you about the stent deposition. You have multiple functions available, rendered views where you can really see um, uh, whether the neocarina is metal free or not, whether your stent depositions are right or not. So, and most importantly, sizing. In larger vessels, majority of the problem is because of the stent sizing. Do you know, you I have multiple case examples where you have the error has been to the tune of 0.5 to 1 millimeter in terms of sizing a vessel. And these examples have been so glaring that I get scared if I have to do the left main segments without OCT because I'm reasonably sure I'm going to angiographically uh, select wrong size uh, stents. Uh, it's a different thing. Different operators have a different approach. But if you have a tool which gives you objectivity in your uh, work, uh, why not have it? You know, rest is all subjective. You know, a lot of people say, in my experience, I've done this, this, this. That is perfectly all right. But um, if you have a tool which changes your subjectivity to objectivity, then it has to be adopted at the earliest. And do you feel, sir, you have done so many cases now, if you don't have an OCT with you, do you feel that your sizing on the basis of your OCT assessment has become better by eyeballing also? What I mean to say, to put the question, I think you understood my question. Thank you. Yeah, I understood your question. So what, what you're trying to say is that at times you do feel insecure, whether you sized it um, well or not. But I tell you something, Dr. Samir, what happens is that it's a long journey and uh, you know, you keep learning at each and every stage. At no stage you can say that, yes, I what I say is the gospel truth or what I say is right and what others say is not. So you keep, uh, you know, getting humbled at different uh, stages of life. But all what I'll say is that it, not every time I eyeball and choose the right size and not every time I choose a stent uh, and I go wrong. So I, I mean, it's just that I 
I will be happier having something by my side which brings more objectivity. So this removes the element of subjectivity and tells me that yes, and I have measured and the measurements have been validated in the phantom models and have been found to be uh, the most accurate. Yeah, the reason I asked this question was because when we started using OCT, we found the left mains to be larger than what we expected. And at times in acute scenarios and we don't have a objective, uh, we don't have an OCT in our hospital, we have to arrange it. So in some of my cases, when I did an acute left main stenting in emergency situation, I was more confident using a 4.5 or even a 5 millimeter balloon to actually post dilate the left main because I had some experience of using the OCT in uh, the left main situations. So uh, probably that gave me more confidence. And uh, recently I had an osteo left main also along with an acute alignment. And I was not uh, afraid of going to 5 millimeter in the osteo left main. So I can disagree with you. I couldn't disagree with you because. Dr. Chadda, have you used that new Metronex telescope guiding catheter, you know, for doing an OCT? Because they say that the tip of the guiding catheter of this uh, telescope is permeable to the infrared light, you know. Uh -huh. So I wanted to know whether you have used it or not. No, for I, this I, I, I haven't, but um, I'm doing a live case on 28th, um, okay. a chip case I'm uh, going to do from Manipal Center. So I, I think a telescope will be made available for that case. And okay. Um, okay. It, it has just been launched. So I've uh, been told that they will make available. So I will share my experience at the end of the case as to how it uh, helped or it did not help. And Medtronic is organizing one meeting. They've um, kind of uh, alerted me for that meeting as a panelist there as an expert panel, which will uh, be sometime end of this month, I think 30th. Uh, or first or second, where they will officially be launching the telescope uh, through a webinar. So I will get the first hand experience only on Wednesday. So okay. at this okay. point of time, I haven't uh, used it. Okay. Okay. And so one more, I, I just wanted to ask, you know, whether this ACS registration will be more useful for intravascular ultrasound rather than for OCT, because OCT gives us so much of clarity and there are so many tools where you can see the side branches and all that, which we often miss when we are doing intravascular ultrasound. So ACS may be more useful when we are doing intravascular ultrasound. That is what I feel. So what is your experience and what do you suggest for us? I think ACR NGCO registration is a very important tool. And uh, the importance of this uh, tool is that it basically uh, reduces the contrast load. What happens is that when I use, when I have a vessel with multiple branches, my orientation of the lesion, or we always orient ourselves in terms of the branches. You know, with the help of our assistants, we say that, okay, five millimeter proximal to diagonal two or five millimeter distal to diagonal three. This is where we land and this is where we'll start. But if I have angioco registration, I will not be taking multiple views or multiple puffs to confirm where my stent will begin and where my stent will uh, land. So my landmarking becomes much easier because without injecting on the um, OCT machine, I'll be able to earmark the proximal and distal landing zones and I'll have an orientation of my OCT image vis-a-vis -vis the angiographic image. So this is the advantage of angioco registration. It, it tells you from where to where. Whereas you have to be mentally alert and your capability of forming the angio image in your mind has to be sharp to do it without angioco registration. So it is definitely a very big help. And I very strongly advise that the ACR software should be made available. And as Savant brought out that it needs an interface of hardware and software, everything together, and it cannot be uh, put on machines which are moving from here to there. And that is not possible. So I, I mean, this is um, uh, an important adage to um, the PCI optimization. If I may ask a question, uh, so most of us, or at least as junior cardiologists, we use OCT for sizing, we use OCT to see apposition, uh, MLD max, but we are pretty weak at tissue characterization. 
so would you what are your tips to improve skills with regards to that is there a journal or a blog or something of that sort which we should be doing so now what i'll tell you is that just keep doing octs your tissue characterization at the end of 3 4 or 5 cases will be as good as that of mine you know it's got such a short learning curve you don't need blogs you have to just you know invariably what happens in the cath lab which i have uh, seen that people um, call for oct they do oct at the end of the procedure they descrub go back see some patient drink a cup of coffee pack up and go home but if you come back and stand behind the machine for a couple of minutes and do it for two or three cases i can assure you that uh, you will not be asking me this question next time on it has got such a short learning curve you will immediately start and defining at the end of three or four cases you will start teaching people okay come i'll show you a lipid plaque come i'll show you a calcium where it is located it's so easy it's so easy so can i ask a question ha uh, please uh hi sir so regarding this sizing of stents which we are talking about now now all these years we have been eyeballing and sizing it i'm sure you uh, with your vast experience you also been doing that and now that you have this oct also how often in your experience has there been a absolute disparity between what your eyeballing size would have been and what the oct is finally showing because i'll tell you mine with whatever little experience i have in smaller vessels like whenever i am thinking of a 2.75 stent the oct will tell me to put a 2.5 whereas in a say a left main situation where i might be thinking of a four the size would be around 5 5.5 sometime does that happen with you quite often the disparity between your eyeballing and your oct so it does happen samir i can't disagree on that um the size disparity in the small vessels is primarily uh, it primarily stems from the fact that uh, el visualization if is not complete you are at a little loss at what size you have to take um the other um, important thing which happens is if the vessel has got a large plaque burden and then you feel little unsure but the um, major and these are things which happen uh, more importantly in the initial phases of oct but as you keep doing it you uh, keep learning and you keep uh, you know kind of re-registering and this your sizing capabilities keep improving but at the end of the day there are two things that you must remember selecting the right size is most important but putting this right size tent properly is even more important so what happens is that i have selected a size of say 2.5 you said that the vessel look 2.75 to me i have put a 2.5 i am very happy if oct tells me 0.25 smaller to begin with but when i do a follow up run and i see kind of under expansion in different areas and i pick up that and i i see that the mlas or the msas are smaller than uh, 4.5 or lesser than 4.5 and i start post dilating i am in a i am very happy because at least i have ensured that i have not caused any distal edge dissection which is a very common thing which will happen in your practice if you select slightly oversized tents and even if you deploy them at an optimal pressure you, you can get into a situation where you will have some distal edge uh, dissections or problems you know and the current generation of stents which you are using you have the size matrix available you can just blow them up agreed so selecting a larger stent can be a handicap in situations than a smaller stent which can be blown up okay. but that is possible only if you selected the right size based on oct and i often say this i give a very nice example for this you know i i opened a shop to provide well fitting clothes to my clients a tailoring shop what do i do after opening that shop i get all ready made garments and i put them inside so now instead of my clients walking in and i taking their measurements and giving them well stitched clothes i give them ready made clothes and i start altering them you know this is the importance of a pre and a post run if you don't take a pre run you just deploy a stent 
and then you start altering that is like providing ready made garments in a tailoring shop and doing alterations but if you are a true tailor a tailor in a true sense you'll do the measurements you'll stitch the clothes well and give them well fitting clothes actually now any sense regarding the sizing when you are uh, with oct when you are using a scaffold uh, now they are coming back with mirrors versus the uh, revolute stones third generation so i heard somewhere in some webinar that probably you need to size it according to the proximal size for the scaffold and you need to size the stent according to the distal reference diameter so what are your thoughts on that sir uh i have very little experience with the current generation uh, scaffolds which have been made available but i will tell you two important facts with scaffolds you know preparation of the coronary bed cannot be less emphasized when you are using scaffold than with any other stent your bed has to be prepared very well you cannot get into a situation you implant a stent and thereafter you now realize that it's a smaller size scaffold which you've chosen now you're going to blow it up no not possible your sizing has to be right and your bed preparation has to be even better you need to prepare your bed very well very well you know these are two hard facts with scaffolds now the third hard fact with scaffold is that you have to be very wary of overlapping them you know so if you've not sized and you've missed something and you now you are looking for another scaffold to be put you are in for trouble so i mean imaging i mean the role of imaging cannot be emphasized more in any other situation than while using scaffolds i um, i specifically omitted this because it's still in the budding stage and and the the new scaffold which is coming to the country now which is being promoted by the given company i i don't think they are making the right noise about the role of imaging and implanting their scaffold so i i mean they they should be making these noises you know before um, i mean um, abbot has a story to tell everyone as to where they went from what they came with so i mean if they have to learn from the mistakes done in the past they should kind of reemphasize the role of imaging the role of sizing the role of bed preparation before the scaffold is selected and implanted struct thickness is not the only thing but bed preparation is very very important they've reduced struct thickness all right but i think they need to emphasize the role of imaging while uh, you select this uh, tool uh, for uh, treating cad obstructive cad Um, my question uh, specifically was regarding the choice of the size. Uh, when you choose a stent, you, you generally size it to the distal a, reference uh, vessel diameter. Yes, you you and, have to you have to choose as per the distal reference. I I don't think you can reinvent the uh, <laughs> reinvent any new thing out of what is already existing. You cannot reinvent the wheel by you know saying that uh, I have now got a stent. And now instead of using the proximal you use the instead of using the distal use the proximal reference no i i i think we cannot go wrong on basic structure samir so i don't uh, think this uh, is a right approach and i i mean if they have said so anyone if he, if someone says or makes such statements you should ask for corroborative evidence corroborative evidence in terms maybe of I, animal I have, studies I, maybe i would have got wrong or something because that was something which actually i could not also digest uh, maybe there no. was something no, some sort of asked for some animal studies or human trials or, or for some initial publication as to how how does one size because it would have certainly been subjected to a lot of clinical research and it has come to the market only after facing uh, after having gone through rigorous trials so um, i don't think you can reinvent the wheel or you can say that now i am going to select the stent size as for the proximal diameter no you can't do that it is still um, 
and uh, um, a tool which is which can cut through your distal vessel and cause distal edge dissections if you and it can uh, compromise your side branches you know if you've not sized it uh, properly by causing carinal shift so i i mean all all the problem with uh, oversizing of stents is possible if you select the wrong size thank you sir tomorrow sir what time you are meeting again same time 7 o'clock alok yes it's it is it is the same time sir it is the same okay. time okay so looking forward to see you again sir great so it's no more questions uh, for your, for your crisp voice you know as as crisp as the images of oct you know it was so nice <laughs> to listen to you sir no no thank you so much alok thank you team abbot for giving this opportunity right sir i really i really enjoyed the session i really enjoyed the session right so thank you so much sir thanks a lot thank for you. taking us uh, through thank this you. wonderful thank presentation you. and uh, taking through the finer details of ocd i'm sure it was insightful for all of us and uh, thanks a ton for that and thanks to all the participants uh, for having such an interactive session i am sure uh, it has been helpful for each one of us thank you so much and i look forward to seeing you all tomorrow uh, same time evening uh, 7 pm thanks a ton yeah so, thank you yeah thank you so much thank sir so much. thanks a lot sir thank you so much Bye. Bye. Good night.